a &P Journal Club number five. Hello, my name is Laird Schaldahl. I'm an anatomy and physiology instructor at Mount Hood Community College in Gresham, Oregon. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about connective tissues. I'll be focusing on some of the proteins found in the extracellular matrix and how those proteins can be used in complicated surgeries. Specifically, ones where there is a large amount of tissue damage and previously would have required removing tissue from one part of the body and grafting it into the injured area. This is the article I'll be summarizing today. If you wish to know more about the research, Science Magazine has a nice video that you can watch. I, on the other hand, will be focusing more on material that I cover in my 200 level a &P class. Our anatomy textbook says that there are three major types of protein fibers found in the extracellular matrix of a typical connective tissue. These fibers are all secreted by cells called fibroblasts. The first are small but springy elastic fibers. Next are much larger collagen fibers, which are very strong. The third type that we can see under the microscope take up more of a web-like appearance and are called reticular fibers. It turns out that reticular fibers are made of collagen and therefore it doesn't really make sense to call these a third type of protein fiber. It's more accurate to say that the third major type of fiber found in the extracellular matrix is one that's difficult to see under the microscope but functionally is very important, and it's called fibronectin. Everything else that's outside of the cells here in the extracellular matrix would be made up of ground substance. Glycosaminoglycans secreted by the fibroblasts can attract water and form a gel-like matrix. The advantage of using protein scaffolds is that they get a head start on the healing process. When a tissue is injured, it will undergo the inflammatory response, and nearby blood vessels will undergo hemostasis. Platelets can stick to newly exposed collagen and activate the intrinsic pathway, while damaged endothelial cells can activate the extrinsic pathway. Both of these induce a cascade of enzymatic reactions with names like factor 10 and factor 8 that ultimately lead to the polymerization of fibrin. A fibrin gel traps blood cells leading to a blood clot. This not only reduces blood loss, but the fibrin scaffold recruits nearby mesenchymal stem cells into the area and helps them to differentiate into the cell type that's needed. The fibrin gel will not last for long it will be removed by the activity of an enzyme called plasmin. If you've ever administered TPA, you have activated this enzyme. So fibroblasts will need to fill in the gap with collagen. This is the regeneration phase of tissue healing. As fibrin is removed, the collagen is added. This collagen is like the collagen you find in dense regular connective tissue or bone tissue, where the collagen fibers run parallel to one another. But in scar tissue, the collagen fibers are cross-linked, meaning this new tissue is different from the tissue that was here previously. Angiogenesis will also be triggered. New blood vessels will grow into the area, bringing much needed nutrients and even more mesenchymal stem cells into this area. At this point, we would have a reddish looking scar. The collagen here can guide these new mesenchymal stem cells into the next phase, which is called remodeling. The mesenchymal stem cells would differentiate into the cell type needed, such as fibroblasts, osteoblasts, or potentially even nervous tissue depending on the scaffold present. Those new fibroblasts could replace some of the scar tissue with dense irregular connective tissue. This would be the last phase of tissue repair called the remodeling phase. 
Surgeons have been taking advantage of one of these protein gels already, in the form of fibrin glue or a fibrin sealant. This is a mixture of fibrinogen plus thrombin that, when mixed together, rapidly forms a blood clot and also acts as an adhesive, holding two ends of a tissue together. Unlike a synthetic adhesive, the fibrin glue can attract mesenchymal stem cells into the area and speed up the healing process. We will be looking at a couple more scaffolds made of extracellular matrix proteins that hold similar potential benefits. So it turns out that connective tissue does a lot more than simply connect one thing to the next thing. And these fibers that we find in the extracellular matrix do more than simply take up space. For instance, they provide a framework along which cells, like our mesenchymal stem cells, can migrate. Mesenchymal stem cells can attach and move along different types of protein fibers depending on which type of integrin cell surface protein that they express. In turn, the integrins can relay information to this mesenchymal stem cell about the nature of the tissue that it's in. If the connective tissue is loose, this mesenchymal stem cell will tend to stay a mesenchymal stem cell. If it's medium density, however, this mesenchymal stem cell can differentiate either into an adipocyte or even neural tissue. In a dense matrix, mesenchymal stem cells tend to differentiate into chondroblasts or osteoblasts. These final decisions will require another signal, usually through the form of some sort of growth factor. Growth factors are molecules that are similar to neurotransmitters or hormones, but ones that are released in just localized areas. For instance, if this mesenchymal stem cell receives a growth factor of the SOX family, it will tend to turn into a chondroblast. Whereas if it receives a signal of the bone morphogen protein or BMP family, that will instruct this mesenchymal stem cell to turn into an osteoblast. One place where we see bioactive polymers already being used in application is in nerve injury repair. Nerves are bundles of axons in the peripheral nervous system, some of which are myelinated by Schwann cells and wrapped in connective tissue. In class, we gave names to the connective tissue based off of where it was located, epineurium, perineurium, and endoneurium, but it's more important to know the proteins that are in there, such as collagen and fibronectin. When there's a small amount of injury to a nerve, the portion of the axons distal to the injury will degenerate, no longer being connected to a cell body. The Schwann cells there can then de-differentiate and start doing something that they haven't done since you were growing, which is to release growth factors. These growth factors will instruct the neurons to regrow their axons. And being confined by the connective tissue, these axons will only have one direction to grow, and that is towards their old target. They will continue to grow until they reach their target and then form a synapse. However, this cannot happen if there's a large amount of injury to the nerve. For instance, even if the axons could regrow, there's no guarantee that they will grow in the correct direction. And with a loss of a lot of Schwann cells, we won't have enough growth factors to stimulate the growth of these axons in the first place. This is where a surgeon might cut a segment of a nerve from one part of the body and graft it in here, or to use a graft from another person. The downside to an autograft is that a piece of nerve is missing from elsewhere in the body, and the downside to an allograft is that the patient may reject the donated tissue. This is where a bioactive scaffold can come in handy. Nerve tissue from a cadaver can be cut to length and stripped of all of its cells, 
leaving behind just the collagen and the fibronectin. And this, this polymer of proteins can be placed into the area filling in the gap. So that when the axons regrow, they will be limited in their direction of growth. What's more is that growth factors can be embedded into these polymers. And these growth factors can recruit mesenchymal stem cells to migrate into this area and then differentiate into Schwann cells. As Schwann cells, they would then start releasing the growth factors that we want that stimulate the growth of axons towards their original targets. Bone tissue has a high capacity for regeneration. When bone tissue is injured, it goes through the repair process very similar to what we discussed earlier. First, inflammation and hemostasis lead to the formation of a blood clot, or hematoma. The fibrin in this hematoma then recruits mesenchymal stem cells into the area, which then start laying down collagen fibers and other extracellular matrix. Rather than producing scar tissue, these cells will produce fibrocartilage, forming a soft callus. This extracellular matrix can recruit even more mesenchymal stem cells and instruct them to differentiate into osteoblasts, which will then replace the soft callus with bone tissue or a hard callus. Later, the osteoblasts can remodel the bone tissue so that compact and spongy bone are located in their proper areas. In a severe fracture, bone tissue cannot repair itself. Remember, osteoblasts require some form of connective tissue model to replace with bone tissue. In the current study, the authors are going to supply a synthetic form of collagen to mimic intramembranous ossification. Previously, surgeons could have done a bone graft, taking bone tissue from elsewhere in the body, one of our less useful bones, like the fibula, and placing it in the gap. Bone grafts have the same problems as nerve grafts. But to start the healing process, we don't need actual bone tissue, we just need its extracellular matrix, in particular, the collagen fibers. The authors used a synthetic form of collagen. Using synthetic polymers raises the possibility that in the future, 3D printers could be used to print the scaffold to fit the shape needed for any individual surgery. In the current study, the synthetic polymer was in gel form that could be spread into the injured area, providing the framework that could help recruit mesenchymal stem cells into the area. In addition to getting the scaffold's density correct, the authors also added the correct growth factor in the form of the BMP molecule. There was, however, a trick into getting the growth factors to the mesenchymal stem cells. That's where the tiny bubbles and ultrasound come into play. Similar to the way that neurotransmitters are rapidly broken down in synapses, Growth factors are slowly broken down in our connective tissues. A simple injection of the growth factor would not have been adequate. To get these mesenchymal stem cells the BMP that they really need, we had to trick them into producing it themselves. And in order to do that, the authors added the DNA for BMP4 into little bubbles and then burst them open with ultrasound once they got to the targeted location. The ultrasound also created temporary holes in the plasma membrane of the mesenchymal stem cells so that they were more likely to take up that DNA. Once they did, they started producing BMPs for weeks, driving their differentiation into osteoblasts and speeding up the healing process of these complicated fractures. So if you've watched this far, then you too think that extracellular matrix is interesting. Everybody else is either a loser or not as educated as we are. Thanks again for watching, and tune in again next month.